Hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Dunker Spot. We are part of 342 Productions. I am your host, Nikaias Duncan, and joining me as always is my co-host, Steve Jones Jr. Steve, how are you doing, sir? Aha, uh-huh, feeling good, feeling great. Happy to be here, excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Dunkers, for once again embracing your bounce. Uh, YouTube, hi. Uh, Nikaias, uh, it's time to hoop it up. It is indeed time to hoop it up. We still have conference finals basketball going on right now, or at least for now. We shall see recording early on a Monday. By the time you listen to this on Tuesday, one series may end, depending on what happens in Celtics Pacers. We're going to talk about that one first, go over the games two and the game threes. I was going to talk about the West end of the conference finals and then get into some W chatter. Before we dig into the actual basketball, I just want to give a quick salute. Uh, Send my condolences to the family of Bill Walton, who passed earlier today at the age of 71, prolonged battle with cancer. Uh, Walton was a Hall of Famer, was named both to the 50th and 75th year anniversary NBA teams, uh, two-time champion and MVP, two-time All-NBA recipient, two-time All-Defense member, sixth man of the year in 1986 with the Boston Celtics, same year he won his second title. Tremendous player, particularly when he was healthy. Left one heck of a legacy as a broadcaster as well. As well, uh, the joy really shown through with whatever he did, and just wanted to quickly give my condolences to the Walton family. Uh, Steve, did you have any uh, Bill Walton thoughts? Uh, rest in peace to Bill Walton and all prayers to his family. I think the news just hit like an hour ago before we started recording. Um, only one Bill Walton. Um, the spirit that he had, the love that he had for the game the way that he was able to deliver the excitement and the passion for the game, no matter what, no matter when. Um, There's never going to be another one. And, you know, in my mind, I think of all the time he spent with my dad and all the games they broadcast and just their friendship overall. So it takes some time to process it, but very appreciative of him as a human. And I hope he and his family find peace and uh, rest in peace. There we go. There we go. Rest in peace to Bill Walton. Um, Not easy to transition from that, but we'll do our best. Transition to some conference finals talk, starting with the East. Um, Since the last time we recorded, two games have happened in the Eastern Conference Finals. The Celtics with a 126 to 110 victory over the Indiana Pacers. 40 points for Jalen Brown in that one. The Pacers offense just kind of dying midway through the third quarter. Uh, So that one kind of blew open in the second half of that game. And then in the game three, the Celtics with a 114 to 111 victory over the Pacers. No Tyrese Halliburton in that one uh, due to hamstring strain. Uh, As of recording, not sure what his status is for the game four that's happening later tonight. I would assume that he's likely going to be out considering the deficit and considering this is the same hamstring that he was dealing with issues with earlier this season. But again, as of right now, 232 Eastern, I have not seen that he's officially been ruled out. Um, But that is where we stand heading into this one. Before we get into specific game talk, Steve, your thoughts on the conference finals so far? We have two 3 0 series as of recording. Uh, what's kind of stood as you theme was? Uh, the conference finals are a sprint. And it's something I just kind of want to hammer home to people. It's a little bit of a different animal. Uh, it's the same type of series. It's best out of seven. It's first of four. It's the same amount of games to win, but it, it is a sprint. Uh, we've talked all playoffs long about how at a certain point in a series it stops being how about how good your team is and more about if your team can solve this very specific thing right now here's the thing about the conference finals right Mm -hmm. while you are trying to solve it your opponent is just as hungry your opponent is working just as hard to keep you exactly where you're at and they're working just as hard to get better and they are looking to end it and the one thing you have to remember it's easy to walk into the playoffs and put, you know, you put 16 on the board. You advance, you put, there's 12 more to go. We got eight left. It's a lot different when you can walk into a locker room and say we're one game away from the finals. Mm-hmm. We're two games away from the finals. It just hits a lot different. You're playing every other day. You have very limited time to sit in these games. You have adjustments and things you want to do in your mind, but these games shift. And your path to victory, your identity is what you have to really just lean on in these moments because you may solve an issue or think you've solved an issue, but another one pops up. I think while we've seen different elements in both these series, it's a reminder that it gets really hard once it comes to this time of year. And you are dealing with a team that is willing to throw every single thing at you and they might do it all in one game. And there's no surprise, second straight year. 
I believe, where two teams are at 3-0 in the conference finals. Mm -hmm. Three straight years of at least one conference finals being 3-0, which is ironic. 2022, Golden State was at 3-0 on Dallas. So I would just keep that in mind as maybe these series end, maybe these teams push it. It's tough when you get to this time of year. It is tough indeed. And in, in, in the case of the Celtics and the Pacers series for Indiana, you throw in your best player being out on top of that. It becomes even more dire to figure things out and figure things out quickly, which is why I salute the game three effort from Indiana. The first half they were able to put together shot well over 60 percent from the field in that first half. They finished the game with 68 paint points, which I think is their highest total that they've had in the playoff games over the last 25 years, which is insane. But ultimately, the Celtics were able to pull that one out late. Drew Holiday with some big plays there. And I think just kind of zooming out with these two games from Celtics Pacers, uh, games two and the game three. One, I remain super impressed with the aggression and the decisiveness that we've seen from the Jays. Their drives had continued to pop all series long. Again, you saw it very early on. You saw it early in Austin with Jayla Brown in the game two. You saw it with Jayla Brown to kick things off in game one. You saw it in the first quarter of game three with Jason Tatum to where they see their spacing, they see a matchup they like, and they go at it. And like that is what we've been kind of calling for Boston to bottle up. And what they've largely done this year when they have the pockets when they don't, we also happen to talk about that as well. But you could just kind of feel the amount of pressure that they put on Indiana. And I appreciated that decisiveness from them. Oh, were you got to say something? Well, well no, it's a cosign. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown set the tone uh, for Boston in that game three victory. Uh, Jason Tatum had it going right from the jump. Uh, his drives, his pull ups, getting switches, getting to the elbow, getting what he wanted. They started the game uh, <laughs> with a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge set play for Jalen Brown. Get the tip, throw it ahead to him. No one else has crosses the three point line. As soon as Miles Turner clears, Jalen Brown drives left and finishes. Boston needs that from those two on top of what they do movement wise. When they put it all together, it's really tough to deal with. Mm -hmm. And like you talk about the general wave with the Celtics, where, you know, this year or even in years past, you have big going to delay. We have pin downs on either side. Jalen Brown can attack if he has it, then he gets downhill. If he doesn't, we can swing to the other side. Here comes Jason Tatum. Like having that wave is tough enough to deal with. And even within the context of this series, you get 40 from Jalen Brown in the game two, and then you get 36, 10, and eight from Jason Tatum in the game three. It's just like it's so difficult to lock in on either one of those guys, much less try to slow both of them down. So again, like they have really done a great job of putting their print on this series inside the arc. And then with Jason Tatum, like we had a discussion, I want to say a week or so ago, about the conversation surrounding Jason Tatum. The three ball hasn't fallen for him, but it feels like he's played very well in just about every other facet of the game. I do want to once again just highlight the playmaking and the passing that we're seeing from Jason Tatum in this postseason. What we've seen from him this season, period, it's been continued growth. It's been like a full like three or four year progression with him that we've talked about throughout the life of the podcast. And something that you've keyed in on is things change for Boston once Tatum consistently started to get two on the ball. We'll say just very quickly on the stat front, game three was the most heavily blitzed game of the series for Jason Tatum so far. Uh, we'll see if that holds in game four as that's played later on tonight. But I'm just really impressed with the timing of the passes, the way that he's reading the floor. And like there were some of the flashier passes, like I think people will remember at the end of game three, him coming off the curl, attacking downhill late in the fourth quarter, that behind the back bounce pass to Al Horford in the left corner for his seventh three of the game, which... Salute to Al Horford for continuing to get those threes up. We, I asked about how willing he would be to take a whole bunch of threes heading into the series and even a little bit in the Cavaliers series. And he just has not stopped shooting <laughs> since that game four, game five, <laughs> excuse me. But like that pass from Jason Tatum stands out. But more than anything else, it's just recognizing I have a switch. I'll drive. I know where this help is coming from. We have this guy station one pass away. I'll make this pass immediately. Or if I don't feel like the help is coming, I'm going to get all the way downhill and really put some pressure on you. That leads to a kick out and that leads to a lay down or I can get into the foul drawing back. It just feels like in the game three in particular, he was in such control of what he wanted to do and had a real sense of what Indiana was trying to do defensively. Like there was a play I want to say in the third quarter. If it's not the timestamp will be on the video as I talk about it. So it's fine. But he ended up getting a switch against Andrew Nimhart, I believe. 
And Indiana came, was well, starting to come with a double team. He just kind of waits it out. Doesn't put, doesn't put the ball on the floor yet. Kind of waits it out. Help shows. It gets back out. As soon as the help leaves, he goes into a jumper. He misses the shot, but it's just like as simple stuff. But that's kind of all you need from Jason Tatum when you can put that kind of pressure on defenses. When you draw that kind of attention, all you have to do is take what the defense gives you. While understanding, because he is as big as he is, as talented as he is, he can also just put pressure on your defense naturally if he wants to. Just kind of take matters into his own hands. But it's been fun watching him balance I need to put my head down or I need to get to these shots versus the defense is doing this. I can just kind of play around with this. I can either make easy passes and trust my really talented teammates to make plays or like on that example, again, it was a missed shot, but I can wait out this help and still get into a comfortable look for myself. It just kind of highlights how well he's reading the game right now. So I did want to give him props on that front. Um, Actually, I'll stop there because I have indie thoughts, but I'll I'll stop there. Uh, What stood out to you over this two game stretch? Uh, between these two teams? I'm, I mean, I'll just stick on Boston. Then we talk about Indiana. But I think with Boston, it's just a lot of talk about who they've played and their path and what they've done. They've taken care of business. And there's value in that. They have done what they need to do. And they fought through whatever adversity has been thrown their way. And I think, you know, when you look at that game against Indiana, it was very interesting. I, I pause and I think about it. When you looked at it, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to figure out exactly where it was. There was a graphic in the first quarter, right? Boston was just doing everything they needed to do. Quit decisions. Brown and Tatum had it going early. They're up 16 to nine. It feels like Boston's going right, to run away with it. Boston six of six, Indiana's four of five. And I was like, this is the series. Now, isn't it? <laughs> but Boston's ability to stick with it, uh, be more aggressive with their switching, be more willing to pressure Pascal Siakam to handle as Indiana threw different things at them and then find a way to win. There's value in that. And I think as a team, when you look at the type of series that Drew Holiday has had on both ends of the floor, his defense has been key, but offensively he's made so many different types of plays for them in key moments where, Hey, we need a, we need a bucket. I'm going to drive. I'm going to run through Siakam. I'm going to get a finish. Oh, Indiana switching. Let me get this screen real quick. Let me get it right back to you and slip for a bucket. Like he's just opened things up that way. You mentioned Tatum and Brown. They've been really good. Al Horford saying, you know what? You guys are going to keep leaving me open. I'm going to let it fire from three. And just the overall mindset as a team to, you know, the Indiana is a, a tricky matchup. They don't take their foot off the pedal. And so no matter how well you're playing in that moment, they're going to keep coming and attacking you. To be able to solve that, I think they deserve credit for it. So I want to give a, just a quick hat tip to Boston. It seems like there's a lot of noise around the series. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that discredits what Boston has done uh, to get to this part of the program. Yeah, like I think it is a positive that they are able to kind of problem solve on the fly. I think it's fair to acknowledge some of the, again, we've talked about in the Cleveland series, in that game two against Miami, to where they can kind of get themselves in trouble with some of the tempo stuff or if some of the switching isn't as tight as it needs to be and what that can open up. Like there are things to poke at when Boston doesn't play well. I think it's fair to point those things out. But overall, for them to get out, to get in their own way and get out of their own way, like it's at least worth, it, at least worth acknowledging they were able to get out of their own way with some things. And that's a step up from what we've seen, you know, over the past like three postseasons for Boston to where they may get themselves into trouble and they can't overcome it now because they dug themselves too deep of a hole. Obviously, different roster this year, but it it is a testament to, okay, we aren't doing what we're supposed to do. That's bad. However, we can kind of lock in and fix this. And for them facing the teams that they face this postseason run, the injuries they have to deal with, you can only play who's in front of you, but it's worth, you know, you got to fight through the adversity that you have. And so even if some of it is self-inflicted, and I think it's fair to acknowledge that portion of it, them getting past it is still a positive sign. Even if it isn't a gold star worthy, like bronze star, if you want to give them that. Can, can we can we settle with bronze star instead of gold star for working through some of the stuff? I feel like there's a middle ground in the overall conversation with Boston. Well, it's funny you mentioned it because I think a lot of the thing is the mistakes or them getting in their own way are loud and noticeable and they feel like the same story so i understand where people come from with that uh, because we saw it in the game three and it's a question we had coming into this series can boston do what they need to do offensively as soon as those guys tatum and brown got going the jazz music stopped 
And now, hey, let's get our matchups. Only it takes 12 to 14 seconds to get to it. And then we miss, and Indiana's off to the races, and they had to get back to what they do. Uh, they figured it out, but, you know, this is where, I guess, for some people, you're hoping they impose their will to a degree as mm-hmm. opposed to figuring it out. But there's value. There's value in winning. So, you know, I typically have the Boston, but I also typically have the Indiana. I'm interested to hear your thoughts because they fought their tails off, man. They did fight their tails off. And I will say, like, first and foremost with Indiana, which has been consistent with them all throughout the season and throughout this postseason run, something that you just alluded to, is that they don't stop. They continue their pace. They continue to drive. They swing. They drive again. We'll go into a pick and roll. We'll drive again. If you make a shot, we're trying to get into our offense early. If you miss a shot or turn the ball over, uh, J.J. Reddit uh, mentioned how deadly live ball turnovers can be against Indiana because they just get up the floor so quickly. They just keep that pressure on you. And so they were. you saw that both in the game two, again, before things just kind of fell off a cliff for them in the second half. And you especially saw it in that game three, in particular in the first half of that game three. That was just a lot of fun to watch. Andrew Nimhart was game from the start. Pascal Siakam was game from the start. Miles Turner, who I had the thought as I was watching the game back, didn't watch it live. I was in Vegas for for Aces Fever. But as I was watching the game back, finally, I was just like, you know what? It kind of feels like Kristaps adjacent to where Miles Turner's kind of had this turn in the postseason where I'm just going to hit all the threes. Also, if I do have a size mismatch, I am setting up shop right here at the free throw line or around that dotted line area. I'm just going to park right here. I'm taller than you. I'll just quickly shoot and turn over you. You're not going to do anything about it. I either make the shot or I miss it, but I'm establishing myself as a threat. It was fun watching Miles Turner just dip into that bag in the game three. And as you mentioned, you know, Boston locking into their switches. We'll quickly note on the numbers front per second spectrum, uh, both both Boston and Indiana switched nearly 40% of the pick and rolls that they saw in that game three, um, a series high for both of them on that front. So both teams leaned further into the switching. And this kind of leads into something I wanted to ask you about on the Boston front. I do think Indiana overall did a really good job, especially early of recognizing that Boston is going to switch a lot of these, a lot of particular actions, or they're going to switch these particular matchups. We can just go right into the post. And it was a lot of Indiana poking at Derek White in particular, saying, okay, you are really good. You made an all defense team. One of the best perimeter defenders in the sport. We know what kind of shot blocker you can be when you're trailing, et cetera. You're also 6'4". We are just going to post you up. And watching Indiana tap that button over and over and over again was just interesting to me. And it kind of gave me like Boston Miami flashbacks over the past couple of postseasons, where it was more so Jimmy Butler just saying, y'all have a bunch of good defenders. You are the smallest one. I can just kind of get to my spot against you. And I just wonder, like, if that becomes, you know, to borrow something that I've learned from you, if that becomes kind of a blueprint into the next series, assuming Boston's either able to win later tonight or just win the series outright, is that something that Minnesota or Dallas, whoever comes out, looks like Dallas right now, is that something that we see replicated in the finals to where it's, let's get Derek White on the switch, not because he's bad, but because he may be the most movable guy in their starting lineup. And we may be we be may be able to generate some pretty good looks there because what also stood out to me on that front is as the game went on, Boston started double teaming those post touches whenever Indiana got Derrick White in the matchup. And I was like, that's not something Boston's really had to do a bunch of this season, this series, or even this postseason. So it was just interesting to watch Indiana poke at it that way, and I wonder how you felt about it. I mean, I wouldn't point it to Derrick White solely on that because. I thought Indiana did a really good job of using the post-ups as something to keep things sticking in their half-court possessions Mm -hmm. without the presence of Tyrese Halliburton. Okay, let's hammer home these post-ups since Boston's committed to switching. I think the the beauty of it for Indiana was not that it just gave them a foundation, but also it gave them balance. So when Boston was able to switch a whole bunch of actions, they were able to now say, okay, fine. We don't have anything after we dr- go drive and kick or we swim the ball. Now let's throw it in the post. Mm-hmm. So we know we can end with the post up at all times. So I, I don't think it's apples to apples because of the way the Indiana played. And even though they spanned a lot of post ups early, it wasn't like that's all we're doing. Like yeah. we're still coming with our wave. You also just have to deal with this. And the amount of times they went to it, I think the variety of people they went to it with, even if it's Obi Toppin or Jackson, like we're going to throw it in there and you guys have to deal with it. That probably changed the math a little bit. 
And I think because of the spacing as well, again, you've defended for 15, 18 seconds, and now you, the ball is just going in. You know, as Indiana had more success, they, they felt like digging in. If you're projecting going forward, two different teams, like I imagine Luca will post up, but mm-hmm. he will cycle through matchups anyways. So I don't know if it's necessarily going to be, hey, let's hunt out Derek White. Um, I think with Minnesota, I mean, it would be cat post-ups, I guess, but that wouldn't be anything new for their attack. So I don't know if it, it would increase the same vulnerability as a Miami, unless it was Anthony Edwards who just hunted a certain person and decided I'm, I can beat you one-on-one no matter what. Yeah. Or Luca hunts a certain person says I can beat you one-on-one no matter what. And now you enter, you're in a cycle where, oh, we don't have someone who can truly guard them. So I think that would be the difference. Like I don't, I don't know if Dallas is going to fully spam post ups. It's what Luca and then PJ and then that's it. It's probably all they're throwing in the in the post for. Yeah, like they'll mm-hmm. sprinkle in the post ups for Kyrie, but that's more so like Kyrie's feeling it more than like Kyrie's bigger than player X and yeah. let's just pound it. Like he's not that kind of post up threat. And then Minnesota is probably what Cat Ant Nas Reed. Hmm. Made, that's it. So I, I just think it's, I think they're two different beasts. Okay, I got you. Like the Obi Toppin one was the one that really popped my eye. It was like end up being like a late clock double, but he got the seal against Derek White. Drew came with a double, then TJ McConnell cuts through and gets like the short jumper to go. And I was like, hey, you know, if they're, if they're starting to double these, like I didn't know how much of that was an effect of what happened in the first half versus hey, it's late clock. Let's just force y'all to do something else. Um, so I didn't know how to gauge that specific example, but that was the one that popped the loudest for me as I was watching that. It's like, okay, th- this feels familiar in which, again, with a list of very good defenders, maybe it's just white by default because he is the smallest guy out here. Among the starters anyway. Naturally, like Peyton Pritchard comes in, you go after him, or, you know, O'Shea Brissett comes in. No Luke Cornette in the game three, but going to game two. Like, all right, fine. If Luke Cornette's in, we have our point of attack here. We know he's going to be in the drop. We find a pocket. So that, that's more so what I was getting to on that front. But like I would say, like between what happened in the game one and Boston snatched victory out of the jaws of the feet after snatching the jaws of the feet out of the I, I, that was just a whole lot in game one. I don't know. What did you say? <laughs> uh, nobody wanted to win game one. We'll, we'll put it that way. And then Boston eventually won it. And in the game three, Drew Holiday which hat tip to you as you listed both of the Celtics starting guards, Drew Holiday and Derek White as X factors slash bellwethers, however you want to frame it. When those two play well, Boston is just a different beast. And buddy, Drew Holiday has just been here this entire series. Timely shot making, timely drives, sprinkled in some post-ups. The defense, again, against Tyrese Halliburton at the end of game one, getting the steal towards the end of game three. It has just been incredibly fun watching him fill gaps and kind of raise the usage when necessary. This is quite literally why you bring Drew Holiday into the fold. You can defend. You can be the anchor of some of the scheme versatility that we want to tap into, similar to what Marcus Smart did when he was here. Hey, we want to sprinkle in more zone possessions than we did in the last round. Drew, you got this. Offensively, please hit corner threes when we need them. Please drive when you have a matchup. If they put someone really small on you, put them on the block. Crash in for an occasional offensive rebound. Run some pick and rolls for us if you want to take some of this pressure off of Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown as primary handlers. Like, he's just been able to do a little bit of everything. It's fun, like, thinking back to what his regular season was, where they didn't ask him to run a ton ton of offense. He could do it, but he was more so overqualified cog in the machine versus being the system. And now watching this round in particular, where they drew, do a little bit more for us. We don't have Chris Stops right now. And again, we don't want Jason and Jalen doing literally everything. And on the nights that Derek White doesn't have it with the pull-ups, we need somebody else. You have an all-star slash champion that could just fill that role for you. It's just the luxury of what Boston has on that roster. And Drew deserves all the love for what he's been able to put together in this round, in particular over the past couple of games. I agree. There we go. There we go. Did you have any closing thoughts or questions or things you're looking ahead to in this game four again by the time you hear this the game four is going to be played but uh, i mean i thought boston continues to get really good mileage out of uh empty side pick and roll with a nice little twist they put al horford or a big or a non-shooter on the opposite wing and it's been able to put pressure on teams because 
one, Boston can use their variety of screeners to open things up. We can have a big screen if we have two in. We can use Tatum as a screener, White as a screener. And what it does is it's empty side. Do you want to switch? If you don't want to switch, we have an opening on the pop. If you do handle that action, we can just advance it. So we've seen them go right to the big and into a dribble handoff. We've seen them go right to the top and into a split. I think that's been good stuff for Boston to find a way to attack matchups, but also make sure they still have a flow. I think, mm -hmm. you know, again, you mentioned Andrew Nivar. I thought he was fantastic in that game. Uh, just the, uh, the mindset that he had to get to the basket over and over and over again was great. Uh, TJ McConnell really fought like heck. Uh, so a really funny stat from that game three. Uh, so TJ McConnell, Andrew Newhard, Miles Turner, and Pascal Siakam all scored 22 or more points, right? Mm -hmm. They are also the only Indiana Pacers that shot free throws in that game. Uh <laughs> I, just, I just thought that was neat. But, I mean, for the Pacers, you just got to fight. Got to find a way to win one at home. Your offense has continued to cook. So you just need to keep that mindset up. Go pedal to the metal. Go 1,000 miles an hour and hope you can bog Boston down. I mean, the game plan doesn't necessarily change. Your path to victory doesn't change. You got to try and do it. If you're Boston, you got to come out with the right mindset. You got to look to put them away, and you've got to be able to keep your pace and your tempo up and execute. Um, it's not going to be an easy one, but you got to take care of business. And to win a game where Drew Holiday and Derek White shot 7 for 21, uh, it's a positive. So we'll, we'll see if Boston's able to build on that and, and uh, cast their ticket into the finals. There you go. Uh, for the Boston Celtics, got to keep the pace up to put the Pacers down. I think that is how you would seal the deal on that one. Uh, also, he's talking about graphics that popped up during the game or just commentary that was brought up during the game. Andrew Nimhar is setting his playoff career high in the first half. <laughs> it was just a very funny note to see. And he finishes with 32 and 9, just as you touched on. The consistent pressure that he put on the Boston Celtics in this one. Very fun game for him. And like if you're the pay also, Rick Carlisle seemed very fired up <laughs> post game of game three. I think we are going to get an inspired effort from the Indiana Pacers. Not that they haven't played inspired basketball to this point, but there may be a little bit of extra juice uh, for taking the lead from how Rick Carlisle sounded post game. That doesn't guarantee a win for them, of course. But I, I am curious to see what they look like first quarter of this game for. Uh, Nikias, you do want to bring up the uh, Pacers running uh, four verts at the end of that game? <laughs> or or, or, Mina, or Mina, Mina Kimes uh, correcting you, say it's more of a drive concept? Man, listen, uh, Mina hit me with the, hey, it's more of a drive con uh, <laughs> concept. Uh, multiple people mentioned mesh. It, it was just funny getting like all the football Twitter in my mentions. Uh, I'm glad that that play call popped up, but it was one heck of a call. Whatever the specific football concept was. That's why I'm Nakai's NBA, not Nakai's NFL. But whatever the concept was, it got Aaron Neesmith a wide open look. From the corner, didn't get it to go, but very cool play call. A uh, quick hat tip to Rick Carlisle. What's had up? you had you ever had you ever seen anything like that before when you were watching basketball? Uh, I don't think that's the first time I had seen it. But that might have been the first time, at least from my recollection, that might be the first time I've seen it like clutch playoff setting. But it was a fun, it was a fun thing to bring out in that spot of the game. Okay, actually, check. very quickly, is this something that you've seen before? This feels like a yes. Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we will then move on to the West. The Dallas Mavericks with a pair of victories <clears throat> over the Minnesota Timberwolves, a one hundred nine one hundred eight win in Game Two. A 116 to 107 victory in game three. The Mavericks with a 3 0 series lead right now. This isn't going to be new commentary. And so I apologize ahead of time. But good Lord, what do you do with Luka Doncic? If there's anything that's really popped for me over this two game span for Dallas, is that that guy just has answers for literally everything. This is something that we've said before. Earlier in this season, we quite literally did a full-blown Luka Doncic breakdown talking about how difficult he is to deal with depending on what coverage you send at him because he can just problem-solve and counter everything that you do. These two games have been a very loud reminder, even with him still not being fully 100%. It was just a nice reminder of, hey, y'all have great personnel. The schemes that you are tossing out make sense. When you are digging into being at the level versus full-blown blitzing, depending on who's screening for me, love the nuance, smart stuff, 
understand it 100%. I have a counter for everything that you want to do. Watching his playmaking pop over these past couple of games, really the entire series, but again, we're going over the last two, but these are two we haven't uh, talked about yet. Dallas just kind of spamming double drag or double pick and roll and Minnesota trying to figure out, should we blitz this one? Should we switch this one? Are we switching the first screen and then blitzing? How do we want to do this? Anytime they put two on the ball, Luca is just firing a dart to the middle of the floor, whether it's Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively, which very quickly on that front, hope Lively's okay. Scary play in the game three, uh, left the game with a neck sprain, did not return. Unsure as of recording what his status is going to be. Uh, for the game for tomorrow. We got some Dwight Powell minutes because Lively was out, et cetera. But back to that action, where they've just been spamming these double pick and rolls over the past couple of games. And it really just turns into a make or miss proposition for Minnesota because like they just haven't been able to solve how early can we get the ball out of Luca's hands? How early can we rotate to the roll? And if we rotate too early, Luca can also just see over the top and fire it to the opposite corner. Oh, let me also let me sprinkle in this advance pass right quick, just so y'all can't get a beat on this. He is just dissecting what Minnesota wants to do. And I've just had a lot of fun watching that portion of the program. Well, let's talk about Luca, man. Okay. You know, I think the biggest thing to build off what you said, this is not new. This is not new. This is not new. Uh Dallas Mavericks fans who like to pull receipts. <laughs> Part of the beauty of what Luca has done is that he can beat every scheme, which is why Dallas has always had an opportunity to compete. When you look at this series, and it's something we talked about coming into it, Minnesota had been able to defend with conviction all playoffs long. They have not been able to do it in this series. You know, everyone and their friend has put out a video talking about all the schemes that Luca has beaten. It's just what he does, but it's the timing of it. When you're able to start a game three out, Knowing the blitz is coming, they go to high pick and roll. Let's just play out of the pocket. Let's make them pay. If you're in a scenario, and I think I think I wrote this down in my notes um, in the, early in the first quarter, if this is a night where Luke is gonna, you know, make all the right plays, Dallas is gonna make you pay, and then the scoring comes, that's a really hard formula to deal with, and that's exactly what Dallas has found a way to consistently do because Luke has been able to get to a spot if you go drop. Luca's been able to make the right read so you don't feel like you really want to blitz. Luca's been able to hurt at the level coverage. Like he's just, he's been able to lead the dance. And I think another thing that stood out, especially in that game three, when Minnesota changed the matchup and they said, Mike Conley, you guard Kyrie. There was a moment where I was like, hey, that means Kyrie can be a screener. That means Derrick Jones Jr. could be a screener. Mm-hmm. That means PJ Washington could be, everyone could be a screener for, for Luca. <laughs> mm-hmm. And now he can kind of, just cycle through things that way and test, hey, what do you want to switch? What do you not want to switch? What are your rotations looking like? And so his command of the attack has been huge and his scoring, the timing of his scoring, knowing when to go for it, knowing what the type of shots to hit, it's been a really tough wave for Minnesota to deal with. It's And the waves want to get where I wanted to get into, as we've seen, like this, the scoring from Kyrie start to pop on top of what Luka's been able to do. Very quickly on the Luca pick and roll front, I want to pull these numbers from second spectrum. Um, so far in this series, when he sees drop coverage, any possession featuring a Luca pick and roll versus drop, 1.18 points per possession, which is an elite number. When he sees a switch, 1.45 points per possession, which is insane. With a big at the level, 1.17 points per possession, which is an elite number. When you get a full blown blitz or a hedge, that drops down to 0.72 points per possession so far in this series. That does not signify the quality of look that Dallas has been able to get out of those actions. 36 reps against those, one turnover in three games. <laughs> when they have tried to legitimately put two on the ball against Luka Doncic. And again, like they've gotten good looks where the corner shots just haven't fallen. Or you'll get Derek Live, uh, excuse me, Daniel Gaffer on the short roll and he doesn't finish over the top. So that isn't Luka's been bad. That is shot hasn't fallen, but they have made Minnesota move. And to put, you know, the first three numbers in perspective, in particular, again, 1.18 against the drop, 1.45 against switching, 1.17 with a big at the level. The league average for pick and rolls during this postseason run is 0.97 points per possession. Luca has been so far in the <laughs> so far above what is quote unquote normal in pick and roll in this series. It is insane. And again, like there is room for upside here. Like as 
important as the shot making for Derrick Jones Jr. in particular was in the OKC series, we haven't gotten the Derrick Jones Jr. four corner threes game. We haven't gotten the big PJ Washington corner three game. And so for this to be what these pick and roll numbers look like outside of that is insane to me. And again, it just pops when you're watching the game. You don't even need the numbers to back this up. But the numbers just made me laugh when I pulled them this morning. Like, yo, there really isn't an answer. And even the bad number, you look at the clips of those, it's just like, well, I don't think Dallas could have did much differently here. Like the straight possession of you need to make a quicker decision when the ball finds you in the corner. But like, again, that ain't Luca fault. You know, to the other side, that's part of the bet that Minnesota makes as they ramp up the blitzes against Luka. He's going to make this pass. We're probably not going to turn him over. At least it's now P.J. Washington making the decision. At least it's Josh Green making a decision. At least it's P.J. Wa- you know, Derrick Jones Jr. making a decision versus Luka getting to lead the dance against Drop, as you mentioned a little bit earlier. And him being able to snake and get into step backs or he just puts his defender in jail. Now it's a late pass or a late lob. It's just, again, it's just been a lot of fun watching Luca operate to this degree. It, it has, and something you touched on made me think. I mean, this has been the, the larger part of the series. Minnesota was right there in these last two games. Mm-hmm. The issue is, one, which scheme do we pick and win? And two, Luca's making us pay. And so those shots have more impact because, okay, they've already laid that we'll make the right reads, we'll make the right play, we'll make you pay that way. But you you haven't had that portion of the program where late in the game, oh, we feel comfortable doing this. And that's where you have to tip the cap for to Luka and Kyrie for understanding the assignment and knowing when we need to turn this offense back up. Mm-hmm. Yes, we need to make these plays, but we need to go ahead and mix these shots in just to remind them this is what we're up to. And now we keep that pressure on them that way. Because there was a, I will say in that game three, there were times where you did feel the weight of some of those traps where, okay, Lucas is not getting downhill. He can't shoot it. Dallas isn't making the pay. Here goes Minnesota on the other end. Mm-hmm. Problem is, how long can you sustain that for? Yeah, that's the one. And then you still have to deal with Luca down the stretch. You still have to deal with Kyrie down the stretch. So you're hoping it holds up. And then they keep making plays. And now you're you're stuck. Okay, do we switch? Do we try and switch? Do we hedge? Do we? They took away the conviction. You take away the conviction. Uh, you take away the fun for your defense because Luka Doncic is surely having a lot of it. And then again, circling back to Kyrie and what he's been able to do with those floaters, with the left hand finishes, with the pull ups both inside the arc and outside of the arc. The transition attacks, we talked a lot about those, you know, post game of game one when he had the huge, what, 24 point first half in the game one, big first half in game one, big second half in game two. And in game three, he just, just a whole lot of supplementary buckets for him throughout that game. Kyrie in the game three, 33 points. When you have multiple games in which him and Luca are combining for 60, like you're generally in trouble. And again, you, you balance out what Luca's been able to do just box score wise, just eye popping with everything that we've tried to do. He's made us feel uncomfortable in. We can't, even when we try to load up, they're getting good stuff and we can't even really afford to fully load up the way that they are on the other end against Anthony Edwards or Carl Anthony Towns, depending on the lineup, because there's Kyrie Irving on the other side of the floor or here's a Luca. ISO. Kyrie's one pass away. Where exactly are we sending the help from? It's just been, it's been actually while we're here, it's just been a really good job by Jason Kidd. Like one, he's just been coaching his tail off defensively this entire postseason and throughout, you know, the post all star break run when they got the new pieces in. But even the way the offense has kind of been layered, like I've been impressed. Like I've talked about it throughout the regular season where you saw more of Luke and Kyrie being used in action together and seeing more of that flow. The spacing's always generally been strong with the group. Like Jason Kidd just deserves props for what he's been able to do. This has been a much blind coach for honestly for fair reasons. But got to give credit where credit is due. Like this has been one heck of a postseason run for him. So I wanted to give him the quick salute there. On the other end, unless you had something else on Dallas, I want to move too fast. Well, no, I just want to add real quick uh, some of the things you mentioned where Dallas gets a switch or Kyrie's looking to ISO and they have tried to show help. Lucas one pass away or those moments where you notice, oh, that's Kyrie that's spaced in the corner. We have a tough decision to make on these rotations. Those are the little things that's also hurt Minnesota to which it's been a blend of which, what do we trust? How do we stop them? Got you. 
I guess just quickly before we move to the Minnesota portion of the program, Jaden Hardy, hello, in this postseason run. Complimentary scoring, but more than anything, the passing has really popped for him, and he's continued to compete defensively. He's pretty much just taken over the Tim Hardaway Jr. rotation spot, which is not something that I anticipated. You saw Tim kind of fall out of favor in the OKC series, but I figured heading into round three, that, okay, game one, you're going to get a run or you'll get two stints. And if you're not playing well, then we just transition back to Jaden since he also had positive minutes in that series. It's just been full-blown Jaden in this series. And he's really provided some positive things for the Mavericks so far through three games. We'll see if that holds up in the game four, but want to give him the salute there. Again, old reliable Dwight Powell coming in with Derek Lively out. Always going to appreciate the screens from him. Uh, he is he was a frequent frequent mention in my screen time series as someone that knows how to get that done. So I do I always will appreciate that portion of the game for him. Uh, we'll not talk about anything else related to Dwight Powell and his performance in game three, but did want to salute the screening. Um, and then Josh Green, just the energy that he provides, the ball pressure that he provides. Again, you want him to consistently make quick decisions when he gets the ball in the corner, whether immediate catch and drive or immediate catch and shot. But I have enjoyed his energy coming off the bench. Um, an added blend of athleticism coming off the bench from Dallas there. So I want to give him the hat tip as well as well on the Minnesota front. Actually, can I start with a question? Sure, man. I guess a thought slash a question. Cause I think there's a lot of conversation around Carl Anthony towns right now and the lack of production that he's given the wolves offensively. And I think a big part of that is just the general help that Dallas has loaded up. So even when Cat gets a favorable catch and even when he's able to win his matchup against a P.J. Washington or whoever's guarding him, he's now dealing with an extra layer of help behind that. So I think Dallas deserves props there. I, I guess my question becomes like what type of looks or what type of shots he's getting to inside the yard. Because like looking at the pure post-ups, those seem to be a lot less fruitful than like face-up slash ISO catch where I can just kind of see everything ahead of time. And I can get downhill to make plays from there. Have you had, has anything popped for you in your notes or anything with like how Cat is attacking, if that makes sense? With how Cat is attacking? Yeah, or I guess like the play type. The play type? I think the number one thing is you have to salute PJ Washington for the work that he's done against Carl Anthony Towns, which gets lost in all the talk about how many shots he's shooting a day and he has to be better and all this, whatever y'all want to talk about. P.J. Washington has taken his catches and pushed them out. So the post-ups that he got, the deep ones, are now closer to the wing. Mm -hmm. He's worked to drive and contain. And if P.J. Washington gets beat, there's help behind him. So that takes away the layups. That takes away the drive. That takes that off the table. The threes aren't falling right now. Uh, They're working Mm -hmm. to contest, but, I mean, sometimes you just miss shots. You have to consider as well one of the pieces for Minnesota for Cat is the minutes when it's him and Nas Reed together, and he's quote unquote at the five to a degree. He has not been able to have the comfort in those lineups because Dallas has not cooperated for the most part. He just hasn't had the minutes against a big traditionally to where, hey, I can get to the pick and pop and I can beat you on a closeout because I popped and now I'm in rhythm. He hasn't had those. He still had to deal with the same issue. And so it's less to me about the type of shots he's generating because, okay. You can say get him an elbow catch, but he's not catching at the elbow. You can say mm-hmm. give him a post up, but he's not catching in the post. You can run him off some screens if you want, but Dallas is pretty physical and willing to switch. So it's on Cat to flip it. He's got to flip the matchup. Mm-hmm. Because that wave is what makes Cat dangerous and what helps the Minnesota offense. When he's able to hurt you in all those different ways, I can drive, I can make shots, I can hit you at the five. That is tough to deal with. Dallas has not given him that in this series. And I, I would I would think people would credit Dallas's defense for that a little bit more than, hey, you just need to play better. Yeah, missing shots is one thing. Mm-hmm. Our, our whole job is to make you miss shots. Our whole job is to make it hard on you. This is, this is the playoffs. You mm-hmm. play your way into not you. That's how it goes. Is there, is there a particular shot you're looking for from Cap? I guess I, I'm trying to make sure I like frame this correctly. I want to make sure I'm clear. Um, like I do think some that you've hammered home all year long is that the drives in general are important for cat. And it did feel like in that third quarter run in particular, the game three, it felt like he found not just success, but he also just kind of found the right cadence against PJ Washington on some of those drives. Like, okay, I know how I can get 
it, you know, inside leverage on those. I know what kind of foot, uh, what kind of footwork I need here. I know what the stride lift needs to be to get to these spots. I know the late help is coming, but I can at least win this matchup easier. I guess more of my question was more like face up versus back to basket with cat with some of the inside the yard touches. I guess that's more so what I was aiming for there. It feels like he's had more success getting two spots and trying to figure out where the help is coming from and adjusting the shot or making passes when he's facing up and going versus like the pure post up touches that I feel like people are calling for since he is still technically bigger than PJ or whoever they throw on him. And like, I'm kind of of the mind, like I'm, you can't completely eliminate post ups in its purest form for cat. But like, I do feel a lot better when he's facing up and, you know, still making quick decisions versus let me try to move PJ with a couple of dribbles, then turn and I'm turning into help. And now I got to adjust from there. I mean, that makes sense. But again, the, the key is also where is he catching on these face ups? Yeah. Where, yeah you're absolutely where, right. Where, where are these generated at? Oh, no, I was going to say, like, no, to your point, like, PJ has absolutely done a good job of pushing these out. Like, you still, even with those, like you don't want Cat starting his attack from the three point line. You want him to be a dribble or two away from the rim to make those more threatening for the defense. And again, Dallas has done a great job of making sure that isn't the case. It's just more so like when he does get inside the yard, just the method of attack. That's probably what I was looking for. The method of attack for Cat, I feel like it'd be a little bit different. And like he mm. felt like he found that in that third quarter. That makes sense. I mean, the whole the game plan is technically push your catchers out because that will allow the help to be there if you do beat us on the drive. Yeah. If he's close to the basket, the help can't be there. And he said he's done his work to try and make those quick decisions. And he's had some strong drives. Even that last game, I'm at the top of the key, quick, boom, boom. They're not giving it to him. And they've been cleaner on the off-ball actions. They've been cleaner when he tries to reject and, and the 5-4 pick and roll. He's just going to have to find it, you know? He, he's going to have to make those plays. He's going to have to put his head down and, and make something happen. But we're having a different talk if he's knocking down threes. I truly believe that. Because part of it is he's one pass away from Anthony Edwards, which I thought was a good adjustment from Minnesota with how Dallas was showing help. And unfortunately, this is a series where he's not making threes. It's the wrong series to be not be making threes. You know, I think if he was three for eight in that game, a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. But because he's not making those shots, if you're Dallas, why do I have to shift my game plan? Why do I have to? What do I have to do differently? You're three of twenty-two from three. Yeah, three or twenty-two from three, and I think uh, the post-game TNT graph was like four of his last thirty-two from three, or something around those lines. That very dull analysis here, but uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves cannot afford for Carl Anthony Towns to shoot like that from deep right now. But hey, that's that's the goal. We need to just make it as hard as we can on Cat and Anthony Edwards. Contest everything, make them earn it, and that's been the difference for me. That's been that's been the difference because they they've gotten Mike Conley performances more aggressive, looking to attack Dallas. They've gotten Nasri games, mm -hmm. plural. They got a Kyle Anderson game. So you've had these moments, but unfortunately, you haven't been able to layer it all together because you haven't had all your pieces going. Mm -hmm. But if you're sitting in there as a coach in the coaches meeting, that's what you want. Either we turn their water off, or we make it a little bit more of a drip for these two. Mm -hmm. If it's both, we're in trouble. But if we can do one, we can live with the other. Mm -hmm. Hey, the faucet out here is it's not working. Well, we got a little bit, a little bit of drip in the other bathroom. Go ahead and check it out. <laughs> Still got some water, got some water going in there. That's that's kind of the mindset you gotta have. Ah, the Steve analogies are back. That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. I guess while we're in the big room, and then we should shift the conversation to Anthony Edwards naturally. I'll just ask you, like, broadly, just how have you felt about the Rudy Gobert series so far? Uh, he needs to stop hitting Luka Doncic. <laughs> that would, that would help. He should stop hitting. He did, like, man, hit him with a clothesline from hell in the stomach and then got a game winner hit on him and then shoved him in game three, two. I'm like, just don't, don't do that. You don't have to do that. Stop poking the bear. I mean, here's, here's the problem for Rudy, right? Mm -hmm. I think people are going to focus in on the defensive end. Uh, I'm not sure that's fair. I'm personally, I'm a little tired of that tennis match of a conversation. Uh, so I would just kindly ask real quick if I can be a little just responsible. If if you are a Rudy Gobert truther, there's no problem with that. You just need to admit some of the things he's not good at defensively. And if you are someone who does not respect Rudy Gobert, just take the time to respect some of the things he's good at defensively. And y'all will stop yelling at each other every single year. 
But until one or both of y'all do that, y'all gonna have the same conversation every single year. And I'm tired of it. I don't want to hear it no more. Please, please just watch the games. But what I would say is the problem for Rudy is offensively, as the series progresses, Dallas is not as concerned with his roles. Mm-hmm. It's either going to be we'll mix in a switch or we'll drop. But we trust our help on the short roll if you catch it high. And we're working to not give up the lob. Mm-hmm. And so do you want to trust him and throw it into in the post? How much do you want to do that? Do you think that's going to change how we defend him? Probably not. So that is part of the issue because, and this is something we talked about all year long, Minnesota philosophically, offensively in a playoff series, what happens if Cat's a switch? What happens if Rudy's a switch? What do you run? Mm-hmm. Feels like we're getting closer to that territory in this series. Not not purely apples to apples, not every single time, but it takes away some of the, the strength from the attack. Mm-hmm. So for me, it, that's a tough combination because I think you need what Rudy does defensively. The problem is offensively, uh, they're helping off of him. If he's not in the screen, Dino Gafford or whoever the big is is roaming. Mm-hmm. If he's in pick and roll with Anthony Edwards and they're at the level, hey, Rudy looks like he's open, but then the weak side just holds and then they recover. And even if you do throw it in and you make him pay, they're going to say do that again and again and again. Mm-hmm. So we've seen some timely baskets, but it's just the overall deal. Uh, that that would probably be my synopsis real quick. Okay. Uh, so – Shockingly, it is another uh, postseason stretch in which the Rudy Gobert offense is a little bit more problematic than defense, even though the defensive stuff is louder when he has to defend in space. Where have we seen or heard this before? Hmm. It's a uh, it is an interesting concept, but no, the the role point is an interesting one. Again, this is something that you've brought up before, so this is anything new for you specifically. But like in the game three, as Dallas felt a little bit more willing to just put two on the ball against Anthony Edwards, I think it was the series high in terms of like blitz rate against him. And you mentioned the pure like at the level possessions on top of that. It's like, okay, well, here you go, Rudy. Make a play with a runway. And like we've seen flashes throughout the postseason of Rudy making correct short roll read and doing so in a timely fashion. But to your point, that isn't the nat, you know, that isn't the flow state for him. That isn't something that he just nails 95% of the time. Like he may take that two dribbles, that second dribble may take him too deep into the paint. And now he's trying to gather, and we know what the gathers and some of the awkward flip shots at the rim could look like. Sometimes making the pass, and he makes the right read, but the passing placement is bad. So even if you had the advantage, it's no longer there by the time the person he passes to is ready to shoot the ball. And so it's a smart dare, and like it's a similar one to what Minnesota's doing on the other end. Oh, hey, Daniel Gafford is the guy screening, and y'all trying to run this pick and roll 40 feet from the basket. Here's two on the ball. Daniel Gafford, make the play. Good job, you did it. Do it again. Rudy Gobert seeing the same thing. And it he hasn't made them pay enough. And then when you mix in some of the other pick and rolls where it's just a switch, one, how much do you trust Rudy to consistently beat that on the block? Probably not much on the consistent front. You hope for the offensive rebounds after a miss or whatever, but you don't have that level of trust. And then something that we've like joked about throughout the the series, uh, the history of the podcast, rather, is like even if it is two on the ball, or even if Rudy does get a switch and then he just puts somebody under the basket with a seal, if it's Ant handling the ball, Ant also has to trust him enough to pass the basketball to Rudy. <laughs> there are also those plays where Ant's like, actually, no, I I think I have a better chance at scoring than you do. Whether that's fair or not, or whether the example is egregious or not, that is also part of the reality. And so until something shifts, either Rudy's better, Rudy's more trusted, Ant just makes more of the shots in one-on-ones after switches and just kind of realizes, okay, if I get this switch, they're going to show help. I have to win with these specific shots in these specific areas. I may not get to the room the way that I want to unless he makes enough of those. And we saw that stretch in the third quarter of game three where Ant just started cooking. It's like, oh, snap, here he comes. Minnesota's taking the lead. Ants feeling it. Now they can kind of get to what they want to offensively. Now they're layering in the stops on the other end. It's fun. Unless you get the super extended stretch of that, Minnesota's going to be in the same boat. And so I am curious to see what that's going to look like in the game four. 
Well, I mean, it, it kind of ties into what we talked about with Luka and Kyrie. Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns have not been able to make Dallas blink defensively. Mm-hmm. While they've thrown mixed different schemes at Anthony Edwards, how many of those are because Anthony Edwards is cooking? And how much of it is we just want to try different things? It's felt a lot more like the latter, where let's just keep you off balance. And so if, if they're able to keep Anthony Edwards off balance and Cats not able to make them pay, they haven't had to change anything. So now you can defend at that higher level for longer stretches of time. Mm-hmm. And I think it's one of those scenarios where if those two were to flip it, it looks different. We kind of got a little blimp, a glimpse of that when Minnesota made that run uh, before Kyrie said absolutely not. But that's <laughs> that's kind of the key. That's the key of the series. They never got to a space where they made Dallas think about changing how they wanted to defend Minnesota. And I think with Anthony Edwards, you mentioned in mixing schemes to throw him off rhythm. One of the biggest things I would point out as a difference in this series is just the type of help they're showing it's Anthony Edwards and his drives. Mm-hmm. He has worked in this series. He's tried to make a whole lot of plays. He's tried to be more aggressive to shoot. He's tried to drive. Dallas has not cooperated. You have to look at the tape and understand when Anthony Edwards drives, he's getting late help. They're rotating that late help. They're committed to making sure there's a body before he gets to the restricted area. And against Phoenix, against Denver, you would see them show early help. Not quite the wall, but you're going to see the nail. You're going to see the corner. These are We're trying to take away your driving lanes. But they showed it early. So Anthony Edwards knew, okay, if I take one dribble this way, I get a commit, I get a quick kick. Or if I take two dribbles that way, I get a quick kick. Or I set up, drive right, go left. That help left. I have, I have the driving lanes I want. And once I get in the paint, it's either like a late, late, late collapse and I can kick it out or I can finish. In this series, they're showing nail help. Looks like he has space. As soon as he attacks the space, there's no more space. <laughs> there's someone uh, with the size and length to rotate to cut him off. There's someone pursuing. There's people inside. And so you almost have the kick by default. And I think the issue for Anthony Edwards is more so he hasn't had the consistent fastball to lean on, if that makes sense. I'm not a yeah. baseball enthusiast. But he hasn't had that one pitch that's hitting the strike zone that he can always lean on which he had in the Phoenix and, and Denver series. So even if the shot wasn't falling, I can lean on this playmaking until I can get the shot going. He's uh, he's um, he's behind the count every time so far in the series. He's having to work his way back up. So shout out to the show for getting me that far. Um, <laughs> there we go. We got two Steve analogies in the pile. We are cooking. But, you know, Minnesota's tried different things. They tried to clear a side for him. And Dallas is saved with the same help. He's done a good job of working to try and get off the ball quick and attack the gaps before Dallas is fully loaded up. Problem is because Dallas is scoring more times than not, they are loaded up. So it's just, it, it's difficult. It's tough. Um, but that this is part of the journey. You are going to find a team that has enough respect for what you do to make it as hard as hell for you to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. That's what playoff basketball is all about. And to circle back to the very beginning of the conversation, it's a testament to how good Dallas's defense has been. And they have been in elite defense pretty much since the All-Star break. I think the stat was, at least looking at NBA.com's number, having checked to clean the glass numbers for the, uh, the garbage time filter, like last 20 games of the season, the Mavericks were the best defense in basketball. Minnesota was the best defense in the league overall, but over the last 20 games stretched, it was Dallas. And that kind of dominance and scheme nuance and all that's carried over throughout this postseason run. Like, it's really a testament to them. Um, last thing slash question I have for you is I quickly roamed Twitter and want to see if there was a Derek Lively update so I can provide it on the pod. Um, I did see a tweet from Mike Curtis about an hour or so ago. Massey Cleaver, right shoulder is back on the court with the rest of the bigs. No sign of Derek Lively anywhere. And so it seems like he may not have practice today. Again, that would probably lean towards we do not see Derek Lively in the game for. But again, nothing official as of recording. Uh, so I'll just ask you broadly, if Derek Lively isn't able to go, is there anything you expect to change like scheme wise for either side? Scheme wise, I mean, the one thing that happened is Dallas did get a little bit smaller as that game progressed and that opened up some drives for Minnesota. So this could be a Nas Reed drive game. This could be a cat drive game. Let's see if we can get him uh, in foul trouble, make you play smaller. Now we just attack, attack, attack. That might be the type of wave you're looking for. So I think it probably alters Dallas's lineups, which and it changes Dallas's size. So it's a while they have size and length, a big element of is we have 
tall. We have a big down there. Yeah. It's not just the, the Yeah. If the help is not the same, does Minnesota feel more free to attack? And does that open more things up? Because again, they've gotten quality performances from other people over the course of the series. If this is now an opportunity for Anthony Edwards and Kat to get loose in a different degree, the lineups not be as strong, and those other people are still getting it going, that's where it gets tough. I mean, they shot 50% in that game three. They just lost. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the main thing is, you know, we're in the what-if category uh, with Minnesota. What if they actually shoot threes better? What if Ant and Cat play better? Mm -hmm. The, the The tough part, again, is Dallas only has to go in their hat and pick one type of way to win. Could be the Luke game. Could be the Kyrie game. Could be both of them again. PJ, mm. big three game. Like, it's this is where it gets tricky. Mm. And it's just funny thinking about, like, the conversations that we've had and have just generally been had about Minnesota's offense, particularly late game offense. The game three, Perkley in the glass, a 119.1 offensive rating in that game for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Like, that is generally good enough to win. And a 102.3 offensive rating in the half court, which is well above where they were in the regular season. The problem is that Dallas is at 129 overall. <laughs> so you can't really – there has to be a level of we got to slow one of, if not both of, Luka and Kyrie down. Obviously a lot easier said than done. But tough sledding for Minnesota. Not impossible, though. Uh, the stat as of now is uh, teams that go up 3-0 in a series are 154-0. So there quite literally has not been a team to come back 3-0 yet. So in a literal sense, it's been impossible so far. Anthony Edwards still confident they can turn things around. So we will see what happens on that front. Any closing thoughts, questions, shout outs that you want to give for either squad before we move to the W? I would probably say you give a shout out to Dallas as a whole for just understanding and believing and keeping the fight going against Minnesota and trusting their defense and trusting each other to recover and help and and make it as tough as heck on Minnesota. I think for Minnesota, you got to find your way offensively. You just need Cat or Ant to have a game and see if that opens more things up for you and see if you can layer that together. There we go. There we go. And on to DW to close things out. We had another weekend full of games, some fun stuff. Again, I had, I got to travel for Aces Fever, one heck of a travel day on Saturday, but that's for another podcast. Uh, made to the game on time. That's all that matters. So got to see uh, Caitlin Clark in person for the first time. Got to see the Aces in person for I, I'm probably losing count at this point. Um, <laughs> watching them in haven't, person. Haven't you but, seen every Aces home game this season? Uh, I have. And, buddy, a lot of fun. Glad to be in the house. Uh, also glad to quite literally be in my house <laughs> for this recording. Uh, Going to be home for a bit. Thank goodness. I got to just, you know, set up shop and relax and not have to worry about it. Flights for a little bit. But anyway, Aces with a big win over the Indiana Fever. Worth noting that the Fever were on the second night of a back-to-back after they got their first win of the season against the Los Angeles Sparks. Caitlin Clark didn't shoot well until she started shooting well and then (sighs) made all of the (laughs) shots in the fourth quarter. She she was fed up. She had enough. And and, and she said, I was due in the postgame presser and felt that. (laughs) Yeah, she meant every bit of that. But no, late shots from... Um, from Caitlin Clark in that one. Kelsey Mitchell was huge in that game. Aaliyah Boston, timely shots. And also, you know, with all the struggles, and I talked about Aaliyah on the last pod and the first, you know, W reaction pod that we did for this regular season, that, you know, the pick and roll chemistry is going to have to come. Um, think she, at the time we talked about it, she was leading the W in post-up uh, possession. She hadn't scored efficiently yet. For all the offensive struggles and, you know, chemistry building that's going on with Aaliyah, I've really enjoyed her defense this season to start things off. And multiple big blocks uh, to close things out against the Sparks in that game. Just in general, like positionally, she feels more sound than she was last year. Like, I've really enjoyed the defense from Malia. And then Timmy Fagbenley. What a run this has been for her, figuratively and literally. Because I think one of the reasons why she has had the impact that she's had offensively which eventually led to her joining the starting lineup for the Indiana Fever against the Aces on Saturday, is because her motor just does not stop at all. And she really does a good job of putting pressure on the defense with her rolls and with her cuts. Whenever there is a missed shot, Timmy's often the first player down the court, which isn't supposed to be normal for your big man. 
but it's someone else grabbing the board or Caitlin running in to grab the board. Timmy's just streaking down the middle of the floor and Caitlin is just dropping in these long distance bombs to Timmy for fast break layups. It's becoming one of my favorite connections in the W. And then you combine that with the defense has some scheme versatility, very mobile, very long as well. She can challenge stuff at the rim. Generally does a good job against post-ups. Like she's gotten off to a really good start. And I posted the stat over the weekend uh, before that fever game. I mean, before that Aces game, excuse me. And I think uh, the Fever were plus 23 in her minutes, uh, total plus minus plus 23, and then like minus 81 in the two minutes that she was off the floor. And it's like role players aren't supposed to have that kind of on-off split. <laughs> but like that number pops. And then again, you watch the film and you just see the natural connection that she has with Caitlin Clark in particular and the little things that she does. Not just screening for Caitlin, not just slipping in those pick and rolls with Caitlin, but some of the off-ball screens that she sets to pry Kelsey Mitchell open. The timely offensive rebounds that she's able to grab. And again, defensively, being able to execute whatever Indiana asks her to do. We may switch on this possession, just funnel. And force a jump shot if you can. If we're going with ice coverage with a pick and roll down the sideline, just be in a position to catch the drive if necessary. And then funnel. Like She's just done what she's supposed to do. And so I want to give her the hat tip for what she's been able to do so far. But that also poses the question of what exactly is this front court about to look like moving forward? Because with her entering the starting lineup, Nalissa Smith went to the bench and did not play a ton when she did. And so I wonder if this is a long term thing. And if it is a long term thing, like what does that say about the long term viability of like Nalissa Smith being a core piece. I do think she is talented. She's very clearly talented. And she has some really nice possessions in the Aces game on Saturday, on both ends of the floor, funny enough. But I have kind of had the thought, like heading into the year, Caitlin Clark, Aaliyah Boston, or I guess in this case, Aaliyah Boston, Caitlin Clark. Aaliyah was there first. And just one rookie of the year was just an all-star. But like those are your two pillars of the franchise. And rightfully so. Kelsey Mitchell's been there. And she was just an all-star last year. That kind of bumps in the list of Smith to four by default. Not by any, you know, no castination of her talent or anything like that, but just by virtue of pedigree, investment. And then again, Kelsey and Aaliyah were literally all-stars last year. And the list is kind of four in the totem pole already. And then you think about the actual on-court fit. Melissa is someone that can knock down shots from the perimeter, but she's not an elite three-point shooter by any stretch. And then in terms of like the defensive versatility, it's not there yet. And so I do wonder, do we eventually meet like a real crossroads with Melissa Smith and her viability with Indiana moving forward? And that's not something that I, I anticipated like asking out loud uh, heading into this season. Could it be as simple as they want to simplify things and get Aaliyah Boston some more shots and maybe unleash Melissa with a different unit? That could be it, yeah. And then hopefully they can blend things back together as the season goes on? That could be the bit. I think that's the ideal outcome of this, that you blend it right back in. She jumps, you know, she goes back into the starting lineup, and then we just kind of talk about this as an inflection point versus a big red button being pressed. So, well, worth keeping an eye on, but I was just... I'm leaning there, just mainly because it just feels like Indiana's trying to figure out what the combinations are. And they're trying to integrate a lot of different pieces. And so if you add the defense, does that make things easier? Can you run different things offensively? Does it open up more uh, catches for Aaliyah Boston? Do we have to run certain things as opposed to we can lean on some of the talent that we have? That's where my mind goes. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And you saw that pop you know, early on in the Aces Fever game. Inbound to Caitlin. Here's this high drag screen 40 feet from the basket. Let's get downhill. We'll get a slip from Timmy if she's the one screening. If it's Aaliyah, I will note on the Caitlin Clark front, as we've talked about what happens when she gets two on the ball or when she gets blitzed or whatever the case may be, she did a tremendous job of stringing out the blitzes or the hedges from the aces and driving those and then finding Aaliyah or finding Timmy. Like to watch that growth in game was a game five, game six for the fever at that point. To see from game one to game five or six and to see how much more comfortable Caitlin looked against that particular coverage, that is a positive sign for the fever and that is a scary sign for everyone else. Because she is downloading that and making adjustments that quickly. And this is with the fever going through in terms of the actual scheduling and when the game's being played. I think this is their toughest stretch of the season. 
or it may wind up being that just because it's seven games in 11 days, I believe. When you actually throw in some legit practice days and some rest days to recuperate and things like that, we should just be seeing a more efficient Caitlin moving forward. And that's scary. Aaliyah Boston gets more comfortable offensively. And now you're combining the defensive impact that we've seen from her with more comfort in the short roll and some of these post-ups being more effective and now sprinkling in more mid-range jumpers as a counter. That should be scary. The Kelsey Mitchell drives continue to hit and the off-ball movement that they, they have with her, that's also scary. And this Indiana Fever transition attack is already fun. So like, I'm, I'm just excited to see how that's going to come together. Um, on the Aces front, You've already mentioned Jackie Young's play, so this isn't anything new for this season of the podcast. But I came away Saturday, and I ended up tweeting about it. It wasn't a career high in assist for Jackie Young, but I feel like Saturday was the best passing game of Jackie Young's career. The diversity of passes from her, and something that I talked to Jackie about and something that I talked with uh, Coach Hammond about last season, and something that Coach Hammond remarked on was, we know how good of a decision-maker Jackie is, she has point guard experience. We trust her with the ball in her hands. I wish she was more daring. I wish she would get a little bit more aggressive as a passer. She just does not want to turn the ball over. And to that point, like you look at her assist turnover ratio throughout her career, like it's been pristine. But like it's clear, like been talking with Becky in particular, that the next step for Jackie was pushing the needle a little bit. There are windows that you can try to hit. And we understand why you don't want to turn the ball over. You don't want to put the offense in arms away. But you become more dangerous if defenses now feel like you can make any pass in the book. And not just you can make any pass in the book, you are willing to make any pass in the book. And so to watch the game on Saturday and it is Jackie, Asia, pick and roll on the left side of the floor. Just watch the third quarter, period. But watching Jackie, Asia, left side of the floor, Jackie comes off live dribble feed to Asia. Short area pass, but just no pickup and no hesitation to make sure the pass is careful. I'm dribbling. I see you. I'm flinging this with the right hand. Asia short jumper. Here's a high early pick and roll with Jackie and Asia. We get a jump pass from Jackie Young to a diving Asia for a layup. I was just like, oh, no. Like, oh, yes, for the aces, because Jackie Young is, is fears she's making another leap. But like, you know, looking at the rest of the league's perspective, oh, no. <laughs> Jackie Young is doing this now. We already can't go under against her because she's become such a deadly pull-up threat from three. She's already a dangerous driver. If we leave her open when she's off ball, she will knock down shots there. She can make any basic read we need her to in pick and roll or just off the catch. She's now sprinkling in jump passes. She's now running pick and rolls on the right side of the floor, tiptoeing the baseline and finding cutters with a live dribble. She is becoming one of, if not the most complete wing in the W, which is a scary thought for everyone involved and obviously encouraging for the Las Vegas Aces. And then on top of that, which it feels funny to bring up Asia second, but after 29 and 15 on Saturday, there's four straight 20 and 10 games for her. It's funny because like you're seeing like new things or more evolution from Asia in terms of her usage. Uh, Coach Hammond talked about during the preseason, like wanting Asia to grab and go more. Like, no, you bring it up and make decisions. And so seeing that stuff being sprinkled in a little bit more has been fun. But it it hasn't even felt like A plus Asia yet. And she's actually like 25 and 12 right now. You run out of things to say about how good Asia is at basketball on both ends of the floor. But like, it, it is scary watching her just subtly add more things to the bag. While the Aces are, you know, running through the stretch without Chelsea Gray right now, and still unclear how long she's going to be out. Um, I guess just on the rate Aces as a general note, like not sure what the roster is going to look like by the end of the week. Um, the Age of Fair, their second round draft pick was waived. Um, that doesn't literally mean that they're going to do something else, but it, it is interesting. Something to note, like they have draft pick, draft pick capital. If they want to make any kind of trade, there are some interesting guards on the market. If they just want to add one that they trust more than the age of fair, who only played, I think, the four minutes of garbage time on Saturday. Those are her only minutes of the game. Kate Martin, the other rookie, has already pretty firmly put herself in the rotation right now. So I'm curious. I would imagine the Aces are going to do something. I don't know if that's signed guard, like Veronica Burton's out there, Destiny Henderson's out there, Odyssey Sim, 
Odyssey Sims, excuse me, Wiley Bet still out there. So they have options there, but I would just say keep an eye on the Aces. I'm sure they're going to do something by the end of the week roster-wise, so we will see what happens on that front. But I think that concludes the Aces fever thoughts for me. Did anything pop for you uh, during that game? Or with the fever in general? Or the Aces in general? The Aces are very good. Ah. The fever, we're going to try and find it. There we go. There we go. There we go. Uh, I guess outside of that... uh, I'm not going to bounce around to all the other 10 teams in the league. I would just very quickly say, as the Minnesota Lynx have gotten off to, I believe, a 4-1 start. Nafisa Collier is very good at basketball. I think we've already talked about the Lynx quite a bit as the season has started. Their defense is much better than I anticipated. If the defense is going to be is, I'm just in on the Lynx. Like my question heading in was, will the defense be good enough for the offense to matter? We got the fun offense stuff. We have the MVP caliber campaign already for, the, uh, for Nafisa Collier, and the defense just seems to be elite. That is terrifying for the rest of the league. Uh, but feet inside the arc just really can't be contended with. Like her mix of drives and pull-ups and post shots, it's just a lot of fun. You send extra help, she can make every pass that you need her to. And then defensively, it's very early in the season, so I obviously have to wait for the sample to grow. But this certainly feels like the best start defensively that she's ever had. Like the block and steal numbers speak for themselves. But beyond that, like she just seems better in space when defending on the perimeter. Better job of being physical without fouling. Better job of funneling things inside. Screen navigation's been tight for her, knowing when to fight over slash when to dunk under and reattach. And then you add in the steals and the blocks on top of that. It's just been a really fun start for Fee. Uh, so I wanted to give the very quick hat tip on the Minnesota Lynx. Again, we talked about him quite a bit on the last pod, so check that out if you want. Um, but I think I'll close off my W observations there. Uh, we'll pass the ball to Steve. Steve, what's popped for you over the last So few I can talk about the Minnesota Lynx because okay. I didn't talk about the Minnesota Lynx on the last pod. Oh, my fault. Uh, my they fault are very G. good at basketball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they have versatility with their bigs. The way they go five out has been really fun, so watch out for them. I'll just bounce around real quick because uh, I know Nakai has other thoughts. Uh, put some respect on the Connecticut Suns uh, name. I was sent a message uh, to you, Nakai, you, uh, so the uh, Connecticut Sun have more wins than the minutes you spent talking about them on the last podcast. <laughs> I was told to deliver that message to you. Wow. Uh, put, some, put some respect on Dewan Shout Bonner's out to name. the undefeated son. Hey, I, I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you. Um, you. Let's see. Uh, put some respect on the Dallas Wings name. Uh, Rike is going to shoot them into any game. They're going to compete. Don't sleep on them. I don't know how Dallas does it every year. Just Hardship, we'll just find some. Hey, Monique, Bill- hey, you want to just hoop? Monique Billings has been hooping her tail off. Yeah. To start the yeah. season. Yeah, Maddie Segris uh, has arrived. Dallas just continues to compete. Uh, the Seattle Storm quietly figuring some things out. Just want to mention that very quickly. The defensive activities perking up. Offensively, a lot more side-to-side stuff. It's a little, it's a little different when it's, oh, right. It's Jewel and Neck on one side. And then if we don't have anything, it's Skylar Diggins Smith and Ezzy on the other side. And oh, we have to just keep defending this. This is no fun. Uh, I am a little bit concerned with the Atlanta Dream. Hmm. Nah, not sure how the uh, a lot of talent. I'm trying to see if they can all do it at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll put it that way. Uh, here, I'll ask you this question. Are you ready? Sure. Stronger MVP case, uh, Kali a copper or Arike on Gubawale? Ooh, stronger MVP case. Um, mm. it's probably Ka for me right now. With all due respect to the forty ball that we just got from Arike over the weekend, but I, I probably lean Ka. Like, it's the massive scoring plus the efficiency plus the defense. Though Arike also has just been working her tail off on that end. It's a continuation of the growth that we saw from her last year, uh, particularly on the ball. Uh, but I think I lean Ka right now. Hmm. Got you. Uh, <laughs> shout out Alana Smith. Uh, 64.7% from three. I want to make sure I mention that. 1.6 steals, 2.2 blocks. Doing a little bit of everything. Yeah, it's been fun. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, do you have any mystic what thoughts? What do you mean? Uh, just, in, just in general, do you have any mystic thoughts? Do you have any mystic thoughts? Uh, I want them to get healthy. Um, Like, stay there. No, I mean, here's the Let's thing. Julie, their window remains very fun. 
Their window was to be to defend, and the defense is not where it needs to be. Mm. Like not even close to where it needs to be. Like that can't be the bit. Mm. Like if you if you're going to average seventy four points, the other team also needs to be closer to that, and they aren't. <laughs> so I mean, it's tough though. You lose to Liberty by five. You lose to Sun by seven. Lose the Sparks by two. You lose the Phoenix by three. And then you could be three and three. Unfortunately, you're 0 and six. And now you face a Dream team that's upset, a Liberty team that's upset, a Sun team that's always upset, a Sky team that has a chip on their shoulder, uh, Indiana Fever. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to figure it out very quickly. It gets hazy. Uh, they got to get Brittany Sykes back soon and very soon. Though, again, a quick shout out to what Julie Van Lue has been able to do as a primary ball handler. I continue to enjoy her passing. Um, But, yeah, it's a lot on Julie. It's a lot on Ariel Atkins to have to initiate. And it's just kind of tough. And as you said, like, they need the defense to kind of be the foundation and keep things close. And it hasn't been the level that we are accustomed to. Also, doesn't help that, like, Shakira's been, like, in and out as they've been trying to manage the minutes as she recovers from the hip injury and stuff. But. Just been a little bit weird. Um, also, you mentioned the sun and Alyssa Thomas. Um, sun sky, huh? That, that was a lot. So, hashtag antics, etc. Uh, you ready, ready to sign up for a first round series? Um, it is. It's very early for that. I, I don't know. I don't. You know. say you don't believe in the sky, or you don't believe in, <laughs> in the sun? Which one? Oh, no, no, no. Well, I know the pick sun. A fan, gonna pick, be a, the first pick a round. pick a fan base to upset. Pick a fan. <laughs> I, I would like the sample to be a little bit larger than four games for the Chicago Sky. I will say I am enjoying their defense. Also, quick shout out to Angel Reese, who is just getting all of the tough matchups in the front court and holding serve. So I want to give her the salute there. But yeah, I need to see a little bit more from Chicago. Um, it's only been four games for him. Fun start. So you, so you need to see more from Chicago or Atlanta? Yes, absolutely. Could not agree more. Pick a team. What you <laughs> oh, need to see more from? I mean, like, it, I mean, Atlanta has like the actual like state slash expectations. So probably Atlanta. They okay, go from so playoffs to we don't know if we're gonna make it because we trying to figure stuff out on both ends. It gets kind of easy. Well, so I guess that's... Atlanta by default because like I just don't have high expectations for the Chicago group. Like this is all new. Hey, Nikaias. What's up? Can you name the one team in the WBA that has a uh, zero point differential? <laughs> Is this the Chicago Sky? No, it's the Atlanta Dream. Ah, well, that, that, would, eh. that would do. As we continue, uh, season two of What Are the Atlanta Dream? Two. Okay, season three. Um, season three of what are the other? I, I give him, I give him a little bit of leeway for like rookie year Ryan. It was just new upstart, etc. Mm. That was just fun. Year two is where you know, you got, hey, here's Alicia Gray. We got some expectations, etc. Uh, Liberty got to figure some things out. Good process for him though. Okay. Defense got hit, but the links are very hard to defend. I'll, I'll make sure I talk about them more later next week on the pod when I'm allowed to talk about the links. <laughs> allow- oh, bro. All right. That's okay. I see what's going on here. Thank you for listening to or watching this episode of The Dunker Spot. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us. We're on Apple, Spotify, RIP Google, uh, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us. Uh, subscribe to JJ Reddit's YouTube channel if you haven't already. We are here every Tuesday. That is the day after Monday, the day before Wednesday. Um, so if you want to check out our conversations and see Steve make faces at me when I make ridiculous takes, uh, you can do that. Uh, beyond that, we have great content going on the channel throughout the week. So you don't want to miss any of that. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter at Nikias NBA. You can follow Steve on Twitter at Steve Jones 20. Join the Dunker Spot community on Twitter. We're having fun discussions in there and also just sharing some funny tweets and things from the watch parties, in which case I should remind you. Join the online Dunker Spot watch party, friends. We are watching playoff hoops every night, or at least we will be as long as these conference final series are going on. Then we have the finals, so we will see what's happening there. Uh, We're also sprinkling in some rewatches, so we may do that for some NBA games. We've been doing a couple of those for the W games as we wait for like the live approval on that front. Uh, But once that happens, we'll also be watching W games live as the season continues there. 
Uh, the link is in the description. So free to make a profile, get your info in there, no shenanigans whatsoever. Come watch Hoops with a very smart and kind basketball community. And with that, we will catch y'all later in the week. Uh, throw it down, big man. <laughs> <laughs>